Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, I uh, uh, was, was looking to uh, talk about uh, how GPU computing came to be. It seems uh, after more than a, a decade of CUDA and uh, programmable GPUs uh, being used for uh, other applications in addition to graphics, uh, it seems like it's always been that way. Uh, but it's also uh, <clears throat> burned into my memory and that of many others uh, the struggle that the GPU computing uh, had to be born. Uh, the, <clears throat> the first uh, general purpose programmable device that, that we built at NVIDIA uh, was uh, G80 or the, the GeForce uh, 8800. And uh, that was launched with CUDA in 2006. And uh, it was very difficult uh, over the next couple of years uh, pushing uh, for adoption for uh, people outside of the graphics field to uh, see value in this device and see value in the computing capabilities of, of graphics processors. Uh, over the next uh, few years, uh, GPUs became an important part of HPC. Uh, going further out, GPUs became uh, used for very important science as part of HPC. Uh, and uh, more, much more recently, uh, GPU accelerated uh, high performance computing uh, really led to the, the uh, broad adoption of deep learning and AI, uh, which I believe is fundamentally going to, to change the nature of, uh, of computing as we know it. So what I want to focus on though is the, the left hand side of, of this time and before uh, how, how we got to the, to the origin story um, of GPU computing. So we started out with uh, purely graphics processing. And the, the devices that we built uh, were purely uh, built to make pictures. Um, in the early 1990s, um, there really was not very much in the way of high quality, high performance graphics at, uh, at an affordable uh, price point. Uh, 3D uh, workstations, uh, 3D uh, graphics computers were, were very expensive. Uh, but uh, with, with uh, increasing uh, semiconductor density and uh, the, the ability to put, pack a bunch more transistors on a chip, uh, there, was, uh, there were a lot of companies that saw the opportunity to build 3D graphics accelerators to attach to PCs to bring 3D graphics to the mass market. And there were uh, 40, maybe 50 or 60, uh, not just the seven dwarfs, there were 40 or 50 dwarfs, little tiny companies uh, vying for this, this great market opportunity. Uh, and the, the uh, competition was, was intense. Uh, many of these companies uh, fell by the wayside in just a couple of years. Uh, lots of interesting hardware ideas, uh, but, but at the end of this free-for-all, PCs uh, took over and replaced uh, the, the high-performance, high-priced workstation as a mass-market access to, to 3D graphics. Over the next uh, 10 years or so, <coughs> we made a, uh, a very uh, gradual but inexorable march toward greater computing power and greater programmability. The first, uh, the first hardware that we built was pretty much uh, a 2D accelerator. We could call it a 2.5D accelerator because you could take 2D triangles and make pictures out of them, and you could add uh, depth information and the, the uh, GPU uh, the graphics processor would compare the depth values and figure out what's in front, but it wouldn't uh, do any kind of operations in a 3D world. You couldn't really move anything around, uh, rotate things in a different direction. That all happened on the CPU. Uh, so that was our first product, the Revo 128. Uh, and in, always in search of better image quality, more interesting pictures, more, more compelling uh, visuals, we added uh, additional features step by step and gradually added in increasing amounts of programmability into the graphics pipeline. But all through, the, through this time, 
everything that we did was within the, the context of a, of a strict pipeline where data comes in the top, gets processed, gets turned into different sorts of data from vertices to pixels, um, in, finally into a, uh, a picture. So moving to the next generation after Revo 128, Revo TNT, uh, really it was our first uh, foray into some sort of <clears throat> multi-processing. We could do uh, highly parallel graphics processing. Two pixels at once could be processed in the pipeline. Uh, moving beyond that, in step with, with the graphics APIs, uh, we added um, 3D geometric transformations. That was the first uh, floating point operations that were in a graphics processor. And really, that's the first device that, that we call the GPU because it was a fully integrated, <coughs> fully capable device that could process triangles and uh, textures and lighting information in a 3D world and make pictures out of it. Um, after that, we began to make the 3D part of this engine, the floating point transformation engine, programmable, where instead of the standard graphics API functions, you could add new kinds of capabilities. You could write your own programs. We moved that down the pipeline with GeForce FX and uh, GeForce 6 so that you could write uh, programs so that your, for your pixels you could do calculations and you could make much more interesting lighting and shading. As we moved down this path uh, and added more transistors at each generation, uh, we added much more floating point horsepower uh, with each new chip that we built. And uh, we always uh, would say that uh, graphics is a much more difficult problem than anything else people do with computers. So we put a lot of additional floating point in the GPU in order to make ever better pictures. Uh, graphics is really uh, what we call an embarrassingly parallel pro problem Every single pixel could be calculated independently, and many other calculations could happen at the same time. So as many parallel floating point operation engines as you can add, we could make great use of. So throughout the early 2000s, as we were adding this additional capability, we had this, this uh, high-powered engine, which, uh, which was used primarily for graphics. But other people began to get interested in it because they were wondering, why is there all this floating point in my, in my PC, but I can't use it? Uh, the reason that it was difficult to use for people is that the processor that we built was a strict pipeline machine built for graphics. The machine, uh, uh, the GPU is the, if you look at the upper right-hand corner of this slide, uh, it's a block diagram of what a PC looked like uh, in this time frame. And uh, the GPU is the, is the little green box kind of off to the side of the rest of the computer. And the way you, you use a GPU to make a picture is you sent uh, geometric information and uh, texture and shading information to the device. Uh, it flows down the pipeline through the uh, top bank of processors, which is the um, the geometric uh, floating point uh, operation engines uh, flows down to the middle uh, bank of processors. Uh, massive parallelism, but flow through. Uh, stream processing, always feeding forward. No, uh, no reprocessing of data except as it goes out all the way through me memory. Uh, the third stage, the, the pixel processing, uh, uh, applies the, the calculated information uh, to the final image. And, uh, and makes the, the resulting picture. So there's a great amount of uh, processing capability here, particularly in the top and middle bank of, of processors, but it's not really accessible unless you're, you're doing graphics operations. So this was, uh, this was not a barrier for, for some uh, creative people. And there was a field that, that came to be uh, spontaneously, it's not something that, that NVIDIA uh, drove, it's something that, that the research community was interested in, uh, called GPGPU, General Purpose Processing on a GPU. This didn't really mean you could write a general purpose program, but it meant that 
if you're willing to take your calculation and hide it inside a graphics program, pretend that you're drawing pixels, you could do something else with all that floating point horse horsepower. So some, some very uh, clever uh, and, uh, and innovative people uh, tried to, to uh, take other problems and map them to this graphics uh, pipeline, uh, solving uh, partial differential equations, uh, doing fast matrix multiplication. These are all things that are uh, uh, fundamental kinds of operations inside of, of the graphics pipeline. So you could take your, uh, your problem, uh, put all of your uh, source data into a texture, into an image, uh, or into an array that would be processed as vertices, and then that could be operated on by the, by the vertex engines or by the pixel engines, and then when you read back from the frame buffer, when you're done, you have, uh, you have your result. Um, and um, it's, only, it's only a little bit arcane and difficult, uh, but it works. Within just a couple years, there were uh, many, many people uh, working in this GP, GPU field. Uh, and uh, we were quite interested in it uh, at NVIDIA, uh, but we weren't really sure um, how to proceed. And there was a, a great talk given at a graphics conference, Euro, Euro Graphics in 2005, by John Owens from UC Davis and David Lubke from NVIDIA. Uh, examining the, the challenges and opportunities of, of GPGPU. Really the biggest, uh, the biggest challenge slash opportunity was finding the killer app for, for this device and for this style of computing. It's really a chicken and egg kind of problem. Uh, we had all this, this computing horsepower, uh, but it was difficult to use, and uh, was it worthwhile for us to invest in making it easier to program, making it usable for, for general purpose computing, or not? There was no real killer app that would, be, would open up new markets for us if, if we did that. Uh, there's also additional uh, barriers related to the, the uh, programming models. Uh, how do we keep the programming model simple uh, to use a, a, a graphics processor, which is a very complex parallel device? And is that a, is that a worthwhile endeavor for a graphics company to do? What, what is the GPU going to look like in the next generation computer? How will, how will graphics processors' um, architecture evolve with the rest of the architecture of, uh, of computing devices? The other uh, complicated points have to do with the nature of the, uh, the graphics processing uh, business. Uh, in order to make pictures, uh, the programs that run on a per vertex and a per pixel basis are very simple. We don't have uh, complicated uh, conditional uh, structures. We don't have uh, precise uh, exception handling and all the, the bells and whistles in, uh, in full-fledged uh, floating point processing on, uh, on CPUs. We don't have 64-bit floating point. Uh, we really have a, <coughs> a collection of capabilities that, that were not put together into a, any kind of solution. So this was a, a real uh, t time of introspection and trying to figure out uh, what, what should we do next? How do we, where do we go from here? Do we just build better graphics processors or do we try to, to build an entirely new kind of machine? The real motivation for trying to build a different kind of machine is uh, if you look at what a GPGPU program looks like, uh, this is a uh, a uh, exaggerated, slightly exaggerated uh, representation. In order to hide your calculation in a graphics program, just doing a simple operation on, let's say, two, two large matrices, uh, adding them together, you have to write a very complicated program to, um, to spoof the, the GPU 
into processing it as a collection of, of uh, pixels with mapping two textures, two arrays of data together, and then reading all that data back out. So it's a tremendous amount of pain and suffering to do uh, simple things. So we looked, um, we looked outside of, of, uh, of the graphics field and uh, the, uh, looking back on it from, from now, GPU computing is, is a great success and uh, success has many fathers. Uh, if, if it was not a great success, uh, you never would have heard of, of all the uh, contributions from different, uh, different areas that, that went into it. Uh, GPUs uh, up to this time had uh, been conceived as highly latency insensitive uh, throughput oriented processors. As you're making a picture, you're uh, transforming triangles, you're calculating pixels, you're reading texture information and performing arithmetic operations on, on that information. And you have potentially great amounts of latency between when you ask for your texture information from the frame buffer and when it actually arrives uh, at the doorstep of the processor. This style of processing uh, looked a lot like uh, something that had been invented at, at uh, Stanford independently, uh, the, the, um, the stream processor kind of architecture where uh, all of the computation is organized so that uh, the, the data comes to the computational elements and streams through the computational elements uh, and so there's always data available to compute with. At the same time at Stanford, uh, Ian Buck was working on his, uh, his PhD thesis and uh, he invented uh, the Brook language, which was uh, uh, designed to be a programming model for stream computing. And uh, this was ported onto GPUs so it's a much easier way of visualizing how to map a computation onto a graphics processor. Uh, when, uh, when Ian graduated, he came to work uh, at NVIDIA with John Nichols, uh, who, uh, and together uh, they and many, many other people worked on building the first uh, uh, graphics uh, GPU computing device. So, uh, what we built, what, what, um, what they, they invented, was a fundamentally new kind of uh, graphics processor, which is uh, designed around a stream processing core. That's the, the bank of processors in the, in the middle that you see there. And instead of building a rigid pipeline, like we used to do, we built a, an array of processors and a bunch of uh, a bunch of glue around the processors to make it look like a graphics pipeline. So when you're drawing pictures, you could take the, the uh, processor array and hide it inside this structure of, of all the graphics specific components that are at the top and at the bottom of the pipeline. But you can also do a personality change and you can use that same array of processors as a general purpose computing engine. So in this personality of a graphics processor, uh, it's, it's not designed to build, to make pictures. It's not designed to run graphics programs. It's designed to run highly parallel programs for any purpose that you want. Uh, and, and the insight of creating this mode of a graphics processor is really what allowed the, the foundations of GPU computing. So John Nichols, uh, who passed away uh, a few years after completing the, this project, uh, is really the father of GPU computing. Uh, and Ian Buck is really the fa father of uh, CUDA, the, the way to program a GPU as a computer. Uh, so in, in uh, 2006, we had built a new, fundamentally new architecture for computing. Uh, you program it differently than, than a, a traditional kind of computer. Uh, you use standard C and later C++ syntax to write your program, but uh, there's a great amount of data parallelism 
and thread parallelism that is exposed. So you have to write your program knowing about the parallelism that you want to express. Uh, this allowed unbelievable amounts of performance that had not been possible before, and new applications uh, that are highly parallel could be built uh, around this. So everything's done. We've got everything built, right? Nothing else to do except we couldn't really find programmers who could write programs for these devices. For this um, kind of product to become a mass market kind of device, pervasive in HPC, pervasively used in, in PCs and workstations, you needed to be uh, programmed by, by real humans. And uh, we found that uh, most of the people that, that we hired from university uh, either had not ever taken a parallel programming class, or if they had taken one, it was uh, a very high-level survey. And so they had very little parallel programming skills. Uh, and in fact, worse than that, uh, by, by um, proceeding through a standard computer science curriculum, they had had serial, single-threaded programming pounded into them so hard Extracting their parallel thinking later was very, very difficult. So around this time, uh, I visited um, dozens of universities, um, uh, giving seminars and talking about the, the problem here, which is that uh, we needed thousands of, of parallel uh, literate programmers, and we couldn't, couldn't find any. We had to train all of our uh, engineers to be parallel programmers ourselves. Uh, and so uh, I asked all of these universities, uh, you, you need to make parallel programming a core requirement in computer science. It needs to be the thing that is taught, not something that is perhaps as an elective or as a graduate course taught. And I have found very, very little interest from uh, administrators at, and uh, department chairs and uh, professors at, at most universities. Um, and really, I only uh, got a warm reception at, at one university, and that was University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. And uh, when I gave my, my seminar and I lamented the problem of poor parallel programming education, uh, the current chair of the computer engineering department, uh, Dick Blehut, um, said, well, if you think this is so important, why don't you do it yourself? So. Uh, he offered uh, one of the professors at, at Illinois, a very successful and popular professor, to co-teach a class with me. So uh, I became a professor, uh, adjunct professor at University of Illinois, and we built a, a course to teach parallel programming using GPU computing. And after the first year of the course, which was very successful, we decided to make all the materials available and, uh, and produce a textbook which we subsequently built uh, three different uh, editions. And uh, uh, this textbook was printed in uh, eight or 10 different languages, uh, and um, uh, close to 100,000 copies have been printed and sold. Uh, and now I think uh, CUDA is taught many, many places, and it really is uh, finally realized that, that teaching parallel programming is is an important part of, of teaching computing. So uh, fast forward to the, to the present, uh, CUDA has, has evolved and improved uh, in many, many different ways, and so have the underlying GPUs for uh, GPU computing. Uh, the architecture of a GPU computing device looks very different now than it did. The, instead of being a small green box off to the side in the block diagram, the GPU is really the core of the, the processor. We build, uh, NVIDIA builds uh, GPUs uh, as a scalable computing engine that can be combined together uh, either in one box or in racks of boxes. 
And due to the, the architecture of the GPU, um, the, the CUDA programming language, load and store atomics, um, not only over the chip, but between chips through the NVLink and NVSwitch, uh, we're able to now program collections of uh, graphics processors as a single GPU in the programming model, and that's extremely powerful and extremely flexible. And these devices are, are now pervasive, and uh, GPU computing is really the calculation engine that has made uh, deep learning and large-scale AI possible. The combination of uh, this uh, broad programmability, the uh, merging of AI into uh, more conventional kind of scientific uh, computation has uh, really been transformative for high-performance computing, uh, enabling uh, hybrid models that are, are much higher performance, much higher fidelity, uh, and I think, uh, again, as I said at the beginning of this talk, uh, GPU computing and AI together uh, over the next decade, I think, will continue to, to really fundamentally change the nature of computing. And uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, what will happen over the next 10 years. Finally, uh, I want to uh, acknowledge uh, a bunch of people who uh, have really uh, had a major impact on, on the work that I've done and on the results on GPU computing and CUDA. Uh, I, I've already uh, mentioned uh, John Nichols and, and Ian Buck, who, who uh, have done uh, tremendous work and really uh, are responsible for the birth of GPU computing and CUDA. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, Bill Daly, who, who joined NVIDIA for the first time at around that time and made uh, really great contributions. Uh, I, I want to also recognize that uh, NVIDIA achieved all the great things that it has achieved uh, through the, the hard work of thousands of people over many years. Uh, lots of uh, the, the smartest people that I ever had a chance to work with, uh, and I think their achievements are uh, really speak for themselves. Now, finally, I want to recognize the, the founders of NVIDIA uh, Curtis Prem and in particular Chris Malakowski and Jensen Huang uh, who have been really wonderful and inspirational for me to work with and uh, looking forward to seeing what, what all these people will do going on in the future. Thank you.